Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Principal Liner Notes podcast. This is Sean Gaylord here with yet another connected conversation, and I am very honored and I'm very grateful to have a really interesting, intriguing, musical-based guest who basically gets the uh, all of the references that, that I make from McCoy Tyner's uh, transcendent piano solo on John Coltrane's "My My Favorite Things," to to me dropping a a very sly reference to the Baja Marimba Band. I'm very very grateful to have Bim Dumbald with us. He is the director of content for Rock and Soul Forever Foundation, and we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago in which uh, Ben and I found out uh, that we share many things in common and that we walk upon the same musical common ground. So Ben, welcome to Principal Liner Notes. Great to be here. Yeah, um, you you flatter me. I'm sure there's references that you could give that would go right over my head. And and, and probably vice versa. <laughs> so, so, so I, again, just, just for the, the, uh, the sake for for those that don't know or or understand, um, you know the the Rock and Soul Forever Foundation, which very much speaks to my sensibility. Maybe just a little bit of background on on that and and how that connects to your work. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the Rock and Soul Forever Foundation was founded about 10, 11 years ago by Stephen Van Zant during um, the era of No Child Left Behind. And there was concern that the arts were being stripped from um, the classrooms with this new program, which I, I think turned out to be fairly accurate. Um, so um, Stephen's intent was to keep the arts in the classroom. And there was a lot of brainstorming, a lot of figuring out how to do that. And the conclusion was using the arts, specifically music, as a way to reach students in non-musical classrooms. So how do you use music to reach students in a history classroom or an English classroom, um, K to 12? And so what developed was a library of totally free materials for teachers that um, we try to do just that. We try to engage uh, students in classrooms through their love of music. And we, um, I think one of the lines that Stephen says is, you know, you don't take uh, the earbuds out of a student and tell them to pay attention. You take the earbuds out and ask them what they're listening to and draw connections, draw historical connections or literary connections to um, the music that students are interested in, because as we both, I think, can agree, you know, music is something that so many people, um, you know, Stephen says, um, students are expert, everyone's an expert in their own taste, and music is so much about that taste. So um, drawing in that interest, that expertise that a student has about the music they love, and expanding it to uh, a content area, whether again, it's, it's social studies or history or ELA, is a way we hope um, to engage students and make, frankly, make teaching perhaps a bit more fun for teachers where they have some flexibility and they can talk about, you mentioned, you know, Stevie Wonder, talk about civil rights with Stevie Wonder. You know, we have an MLK lesson that looks at the happy birthday song, right? So talk about how uh, Stevie Wonder played a huge role in creating the MLK holiday that just happened. So that's that's kind of the goal. Everything's free and free of charge. Um, I don't know if you want kind of the insider look. That's kind of the spiel that we give um, to people interested in the program. It's teachrock.org. Very easy to get to. And uh, yeah, check out. So so looking back on, you know, your your backstory and and uh, and, and and in the spirit of, of teach rock and, and music being this entry point in a non-musical classroom. Did you have a similar experience growing up? Did you have kind of a moment uh, where as a student, um, you, you know, it was that teacher that asked you, uh, hey, what are you listening to? Or what, what's that What's that eight track you have tucked under your arm there, young Ben? <laughs> yeah, I really wish I had that story. It'd be very helpful in my career to have that story about a teacher that kind of 
recognized my love of music. I certainly had many, many teachers that I loved um, and really appreciated. But I don't have that story about a teacher that recognized my love. And I always joke um, with my family, you know, I wasn't the best uh, high school student. I was like, uh, perhaps a lot of your listeners, very rebellious, right? I didn't want to play by the rules. I didn't do that well in high school. But as soon as I entered college, I started the music program. And suddenly this like C average student became the C average, B average um, high school student became, you know, uh, an A plus student because at the college level, I was I was a music major and I could choose all the electives I wanted. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately, I don't have that one teacher that would like look that realized my love of music. But hopefully um, I am in the minority. Right. I'm hoping, you know, that there are teachers and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are. Maybe I got unlucky. Um, and hopefully, you know, Teach Rock allows that connection point where teachers interested in music and students interested in music can connect. Yeah. Gotcha. I um, I was lucky. You know, my sophomore year in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, circa 1985, where where I had a teacher his first year uh, who um, in, in an English two English two class introduced us to horse latitudes by mm. the doors. And you know, I thought I knew the doors, you know, I knew like my yeah. father and, you know, I remember seeing, I remember, you know, staying up late one night watching apocalypse now on HBO and seeing, yeah. but I had never heard poetry and rock and all of that fuse and that kind of i mean horse latitudes is a very disturbing song mm -hmm. uh, or poem rather but but that was kind of like my 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 entry point you know and 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 it, that kind of ethos it, it, again connects to to teach rock by taking something in a non musical vein and then it all connects cuz music is that divine language we all share but that was you know just upon reflection that was kind of like my entry point yeah I do remember my senior year, my, I had an English teacher. And I remember one day he, we didn't do the lesson. He came in and he's like, I'm sorry, we, we can't do the lesson right now because we have to listen to this. It's the most amazing thing I heard. And he puts in uh, Kid A from Radiohead. Yes. <laughs> so I loved it. Some other students were like, uh, what's going on? He was, he was the closest I get. He, he, um, he refused to follow the curriculum and and uh, showed us a bunch of Allen Ginsberg poems, you know, the ones that are appropriate for yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, 12th grade. Um, so he was probably the closest I got. And I, I liked him a lot. Yeah. You, you know, that, that, that reminds me, man, I, um, you know, early in my teaching, because I would infuse music, I became a high school English teacher. And of course, I'm I'm a I am a Beatles aficionado, somewhat of a fan, <laughs> to say to say the least. And um, I would always call upon Sergeant Pepper as as being this iconic masterpiece, and I still do. And I and I would bemoan the the generation, the current. You know, this was ninety, you know, ninety two, ninety three, ninety four, ninety five, and I would say, you know, Sergeant Pepper only comes once. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't think we'll ever see anything like that again, this cultural, you know, zeitgeist, this this thing, you know, and, and, and I remember a student probably very similar in sensib sensibility to you. Uh, I'll never, I will never forget this. It was 95, it was the fall of 95 or winter of 95, I forget when it is. And uh, he said, Mr. Gaylord, I, th I think we have our Sergeant Pepper. I said, what, do you, what, are you, what are you talking about? He says, you know that band Radiohead? I said, yeah guys that do creep he said okay computer that's our sergeant yeah Pepper. go go he says you need you need to go to tower records i was teaching in dc at the time mm -hmm. uh no um yeah and he said go go get it do it find it and and i did and um i, I came back and i said I, I think you have your sergeant pepper and then of course the whole kid a okay computer debate right. you know which um is is a is a fun radio head head thing but kid a is is a heck of an album so are you yeah. are, are you camp kid a or okay computer or oh that's hard to i mean i know they're kind of they're they're twin albums in a weird way you know um i'm not going to answer that i refuse to answer that question 
<laughs> I love them both. I think they're both amazing. I got you, man. Du duly noted. It's like me saying, uh, who's my favorite Beatle? And I, I don't, I really don't have. Well, it. I can answer that question, but you okay. have more of an in. Yeah. So, um, so do, who, who's yours? George. Oh yeah. I think George is, um, he carries my, my interests and my sentimentality more than the other ones. Mm -hmm. I think we're the most alike if I had to choose. He also wrote some of the best songs. He did, you know, uh, you know, here comes the sun, uh, something, you know, uh, yeah. you know, and then, and then of course all things must pass is to me, I think is the best, the best of the solo, uh, oeuvre of, of the yeah. people. So, and you'll see when you ask, I know you're going to ask me some questions about albums. You'll see, I'm very much inclined towards that kind of spiritual side of music. Nice. And certainly I think, uh, well, I don't want to make the argument to you, but I think one can make the argument that George certainly en encapsulated that maybe more than the other three. I, I, yeah, absolutely. In, in your kind of vein as, as a music educator and, and helping teachers and, and schools, you know, kind of bridge, bridge that gap. Do you, do you see a, a recurring trend in terms of a need do you see um you know certain lessons and activities being called upon more so than than, than others i'm just curious i think no i think one of the biggest challenges and you know bloggers and people write about how there's no more kind of monoculture anymore right with the internet with the um just you know all the ways to access music you know we people don't go to tower records anymore and see at the end of the aisle and that's how the conversation starts yeah so you know our our mission is to reach students through music and i feel like it's it that's one of the biggest difficulties because students are now accessing music not only through spotify but through youtube through video games right there's kids that just listen to video game soundtracks so um, it's hard to find those anchor points anymore and to say, yes, this is what all the teachers really will use to engage students. This is the song, this is the artist, and we try very hard, but it, it's almost an impossible task and we really try our best. So in terms of kind of the music that we try to do, we certainly try to kind of make um, as many lessons as we can with, with contemporary music. Mm -hmm. Um, but even then it, it becomes, you know, are we reaching a huge amount? Because, you know, the, I, to your point, you know, I like with Sgt. Pepper, that was an album I'm sure half of America, if not all of America was listening to young mm. people. And in this day and age, you know, I don't know if that's the case anymore. I don't know if there's an album that everyone is listening to or an artist everyone is listening to, because, you know, like I look at my son and he's on YouTube all the time, like following the, the the people he loves, and his friends follow YouTubers that he doesn't know about. You know, so I feel like with music, it's often the same way. It's become very kind of um, not individualized, but people find their niches, and it's a lot easier to find the niche. So for for us, trying to make life easier for teachers, it's really hard to know what all those niches are. Yeah, I mean, as as I think about even. In, in my own generation, you know, as a, as a Gen Xer, so to speak, you know, I'm thinking 1987 when Joshua Tree came out, like that was an album mm -hmm. that was everywhere. And, and that was an album, you know, when you would go to the record store and you would see the big display and, and different people would, you know, kind of commune around that um, or, or, you know, not everyone, I mean, I, I'm pre YouTube, I'm pre iTunes. So, it, you know, if I didn't have enough money to get Joshua tree, uh, I would borrow a copy from a friend or I would give, give a friend a, a, a cassette tape and say, Hey, can you copy the new, you, you know, and, and, it, and it would start, you know, the, you know, mixtapes and, and yeah. all that kind of community aspect that is different now, right? Because we're yeah. in this, uh, downloaded, um spotify thing and, and music is a whole lot easier to access or or scores of music uh loads of music you know so so yeah to me 
you know, as, as you were saying that, I'm thinking, well, what would be the closest thing today? I mean, is, is would it would it be Taylor Swift when she, uh, you know, drop drops one of her albums, or Beyonce, you know, the surprise album, you know, at midnight, uh, at Friday that you know no one knows about, and and right. it is, you know, I don't know that, but that that isn't that is an interesting point about this kind of different way that people connect through music and it's not necessarily individualized maybe it's accessed more individualized right but yeah it just that, well, yeah. yeah i feel like you know i it's good and bad right because like you can have all these really amazing communities develop online over the most obscure genre you know like i don't know tibetan hip-hop and whatever it may be yeah, and yeah. you're gonna have like fans all over the world talking about it in a way you couldn't like if you're the one kid from peoria into tibetan hip-hop mm -hmm. how many people you're gonna run into so i think there's there's some the beauty of it but there's also like you know i'm i'm maybe nostalgic but the the missing physicality like to your point like when i was in junior high and high school you'd find out someone got this album and you just go over to their house Yes. And like, yes. listen to it. And that's yes. what you would do after school. Like, oh my God, you got that? Can I come over and can we listen to it? And then you'd, you'd know which friends had the good stereo system. So sometimes <laughs> you'd get an album and be like, no, 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 I'm not. Don't come over here. I'm going to go over to your house and I'm going to bring it. So we can listen to you on your system. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, like I'm, I'm, I'm inevitably maybe nostalgic about all that, but I think there is something there about the just being in presence of other people you know and like um and i hope people still do that maybe in cars or whatever maybe they get together and listen together well we we've come a long way since homer gathered around a campfire and and talked about the iliad and the odyssey and yeah. and you know i mean you know i think about radio and and just all the you know and you know even mtv that was hey they're gonna yeah. debut the new Michael Jackson video, or or the new um, you know U two video, or Springsteen, or whatever. Uh, let, man, he, let's meet. Or not everybody had MTV, right? Not everyone had cable, so you'd go to somebody's house and 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 watch it and go, wow, what, what man, that that was something, right? You know yeah. that that communal aspect. I think is it's di it's it's. I'm with you too. Like it's it's nostalgic. I'm a vinyl uh junkie always have been and and something about going into a record store that act of right. going to this kind of mecca and 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 you're and you know you're you're flipping through records and somebody's shoulder to shoulder with you and and you're hey you want to switch your wow that's a good album where you overhear a mm -hmm. conversation about um the trogs or, or whatever it is. Right. And, and you go, Hey, I know that, or what? I didn't know spinal tap, you know, that just those little moments that, that yeah. I think are, that I hold on to as, as best as I can. Yeah, for sure. It's heavy. So I'd love to hear about, um, you know, your own performance and, and uh, you know, looking at, at, at your, your background, the marimba band and uh mm. i'm a project and and uh i um i i, I just i'm all, i'm all, i'm a sucker for the marimba uh mm -hmm. and fan of it you know having having listened to the baja marimba band so i i gotta i got let's go there sure i'd love to talk about the marimba um so i got my degree in percussion performance and then my my um undergrad my bachelor's in percussion mm -hmm. performance so i was exposed to you know um all the percussion instruments you know the drum set the marimba the vibraphone all those things and um i think junior senior year my parents and i i was fortunate enough that we went halvesies on a marimba which aren't cheap instruments as you can imagine so I've owned one for a long time. And then I kind of went more the academic route and I got degrees in ethnomusicology and I was on the computer a lot more than I was, you know, on the computer writing and my head in a book more than I was playing instruments. But um, it was actually the pandemic where I kind of turned around and, and started playing my marimba again. Um, Cause what else was there to do? You know, I chose not to bake sourdough or whatever. I chose to play the marimba. That's how I uh, <laughs> spent my time. And I kind of, fell in love with the instrument again and um i love it and 
you know, if should I describe the marimba in case people are please? Yeah, some people may not have any idea. What yeah, so it's. I mean, I think most people know what a xylophone is. So mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a larger xylophone. Originally came uh, from Africa. Um, it the the marimba we see today is arranged um, much like a uh, I was about to say computer keyboard, a piano keyboard with the yeah. two two accidentals and three accidentals, right? Um, and it was developed in Central America, and then it was taken um, by a guy named uh, Musser um, and kind of mass manufactured because he thought it was an interesting instrument and became an instrument, very popular instrument in North America. Um, but it was always a folk instrument, right? And this is something that's kind of, I find most intriguing about this because um, at this point in time, it's become very a, a very virtuosic kind of instrument. And um, it is hard to play. You know, you have four mallets in two hands and it's a huge instrument over six feet. Um, so you're moving around a lot to hit all these wooden notes. Mm. Um, and it became very virtuosic in, at least in the college world, you know, like contemporary composers would write music that were that was very difficult. And I felt learning this music, you know, while listening to all this kind of folkloric music from Guatemala and stuff, I wanted to kind of bring back the, again, that community aspect of like, and it's also very fun to play. Like you give anyone a mallet and tell them to hit a marimba it'll sound good what they hit is going to sound good that's not the case if you give someone a saxophone or a violin right mm -hmm. and i thought for kids that's especially important because it's i mean not to say that kids need instant gratification there's there's you know a an importance to a process right and getting good at an instrument but there's also something amazing about a kid playing two notes and three notes and it's sounding good immediately. Right on. And then they're able to, to, to be free and to compose just hitting these notes together. And I, and so I started a program in New York um, called Marimba Band, And I, I spent a lot of money getting three marimbas, smaller marimbas. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I rented space from a church and I started this program, uh, elementary program for grade schoolers where they were learning music on marimba. And I emphasized um, that they had to, well, I emphasized much in the teach rock vein, you know, what is your favorite song? Let's learn how to play it. So a lot of Taylor Swift, a lot of Taylor Swift on the marimba, you can uh -huh. imagine. Nice. Um, and, um, and then I also said, you need to compose a piece, right? And again, I felt like that instrument there's a lot working against it. It's expensive. It's ginormous. Um, but there's a lot working for it, too. It, it, you can play it and it sounds good. And um, you can easily start making little ostinatos or riffs um, without much musical background and without a whole lot of technique. Now, Marimba Puris out there might yell at me for this, but it's true. Like, you can make it sound good mm -hmm. without having to master much technique. So it was a, a wonderful experience working with these kids. I have videos of them performing, you know, um, pop songs and Taylor Swift songs to their parents. And um, I hope I, I recently moved and I'm hoping one of my goals is to start it up again. Um, okay. But I, I loved how rewarding an instrument that is easily accessible, mm -hmm. um, seeing that that like instant recognition for kids that within five minutes, can play it, it sounds good. And then they're making their own music with it. And it, it's just a, a wonderful thing to observe. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, Ben. And yeah. I guess as a, as a point of reference for those who are, who are tuning in um, for the marimba, I, I would, I would direct people to the 1966 uh, hit by the Rolling Stones under my thumb yeah um, where brian jones uh pl plays the plays that riff that's the marimba uh the da -na 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 -na, you know um apologies to uh mick jagger if you're, mm -hmm. if you're tuning in i i will not i will not attempt any vocalization of any stone song but uh that's probably the most famous and accessible um mm -hmm. if folks have heard the marimba probably all their life if they have if they had that stone song yeah. A Stone's Greatest Hits album. 
So plus the uh, the Apple ringtone, the Maroon by Apple ringtone, right? Yes, yes, um, that's right, that's right, yeah. that's right, that's right. But, but if I may push, you know, I have to. I've spent a lot of years studying ethnomusicology, so if I can push anything, look. If you're interested, look into kind of the the music from Chiapas, Mexico, southern Mexico, Guatemala. That's kind of where it all started, right? And got gotcha. uh, Got to get to the root. Fun of the music. Story. It's it's great. It's folkloric. It's really fun music. Yeah, check it out. Yeah, that. Uh, I, and I love how you framed it in terms of the accessibility. Uh, I was in our music classroom day before yesterday and the music teacher, as I shared before we started recording, had a, had a bunch of marimbas out. And I just went crazy. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I I sounded cool. I mean, I did. It, you're, you're right. You can't hit a bad note. There's just something mm -hmm. about resonance and the sustain on it. And and it's just it and and, and, the, and the the naturalness of it. Right. Because right. wood and there's just something very earthy and organic uh, and real about it which, yeah. which, which is which is fun to play it's it's like the percussionist's dilemma right we always hear the jokes that it's easy to play you don't need to read music we're drooling and stuff of course you know you listen to like tony williams on drum set or evelyn glenny on marimba and you know it's you know there's some real talent yeah. but i also feel like um percussionists can embrace the fact that it's easy to play a drum that it's easy to play these instruments because that is um it makes it powerful for kids and it makes it powerful that it's an easy entry point you know so i like to tend i tend to think of percussion as the best of both worlds it's a very easy entry point but you know the the level of mastery never ends like any instrument right that's right well we you know to take a take a page from uh the godfather so we always got to give the drummer some so <laughs> <laughs> always right yeah always always for for the principal or the 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 math teacher the non-music person that is tuning in whether they're viewing this or listening um and they're saying hey you know that's great ben you know teach rock music wonderful I gotta, I gotta get to quadratic equations by November. I'm a, I'm a history teacher. I got, I got the AP exam, you know, mm -hmm. hanging over me. I gotta, we, we gotta be, you know, marching into Atlanta with Sherman, you know, by October fifteenth or else. I don't have time for music. I've got, I've got high, te I got testing. I got high stakes. I got all the, these things on me. I'm grading research papers. What what do you say to those folks that that are indulging in this podcast, but are going, you know what? I don't I don't have time to put on. A right. I mean, we we more than anyone absolutely recognize the pressure teachers are under to teach to standards to, you know, if you're a general music to teach to that performance at the end. You know, how much time do I have to contextualize this song if the kids need to know how to play it by, you know, June or wherever? Um, so what I tend to say to them is, you know, we try very, very hard to align things with standards. Mm -hmm. Um, and we try very hard to make things modular so that, you know, um, you don't, I, I would say, don't feel pressured to, when you look at one of our lessons to use it all, right? Please don't feel pressured. We write it in a way, and we try very hard to make it a nice narrative that flows through the class. But we recognize that um, sometimes that's not possible, right? Um, it's not possible to to spend all that time and and you know take a take a um, a few steps out of it. Take you know I I um, I try to observe teachers whenever I can teaching our curriculum. It's very helpful to be you know as director of curriculum or director of content. It's very helpful for me to see how the product is used, and it, it runs the gamut. I saw one amazing teacher that ran through the whole lesson and then another amazing teacher it was a stonewall lesson i think and she showed two pictures and the conversation that came from that class nice. from just two pictures was kind of amazing um so you know far you know obviously you know seeing all this i've, I've come to recognize that k-12 teachers do amazing things with very limited resources right on um 
I think I'll give an example of kind of what we're working on where we're, we're trying to address that. So recently we, we were lucky enough to receive a grant from the Library of Congress to create a curriculum of American history. Mm -hmm. We're doing reconstruction to the present. Mm. Um, and the premise is let's look at music as a primary source, right? Because all history teachers, I think, a primary source analysis is a big part of what they do. And so, you know, we're, we're working on all these lessons that use um, primary sources as a means to teach history across the board. I have one great, he's actually a social studies teacher in Denver. He's writing a lesson um, about immigration that looks at the sales figures of Gibson and um, um, what's the, or Hammond, right? All these companies were started yeah. by immigrants from Europe, right? right? So they're looking at all these sales records and seeing, well, this is what the immigrant experience could be for Americans, right? This person comes um, and starts this company and, and the sales, you know, so um, we're trying to think through ways that, you know, you're already using primary sources in your history class. Consider using something maybe different rather than like the the intake forms of Ellis Island or something. Yeah. Maybe look at, you know, um, pictures of all the instruments, right, um, that we provide that people brought with them to Ellis Island, right? Um, so we're trying, we, we're, we're to, to keep it short, we're trying very hard. We recognize that it's really tough, right? And a lot of curriculums are planned. So we're, we're trying our very best to find ways to align those so that if teacher is on this one pathway that their district or their school requires, maybe they can look to the left and there's another pathway, the teach rock pathway that's really close. And maybe sometimes they can kind of, um, you know, veer off the pathway and kind of take the teach rock pathway a little bit. I don't know if that metaphor is particularly good, but uh, it's the first it. time I've used it. <laughs> I dig it and I'll, and I'll take it because, you know, there's, you know, when, when we're talking about education, you know, we try to move, move away from a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And, and the more that we can personalize education, the more that, that we can build relationships and, and a culture in the classroom where, where students feel safe and, and acknowledged and, and heard uh, the better and, and, and music can be that vehicle, right. Mm -hmm. um, to, to create, to create that culture and, and to make learning meaningful and, and, and lasting. So I, um, I very much appreciate uh, that, that example with, with immigration and rather than looking at uh, records from Alice Island, wow, let's, let's, let's take a look at, um, you know, uh, Hammond, let's take a look, let's take a look at Gretsch. Let's take a look right. at Rickenbacker. Gretsch is another of, one. Yeah. 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 All those things, which Fender, you know, all, all of the, there's just so many interesting stories yeah. about, about the, the, the American experience and the American immigrant mm -hmm. uh, experience as, as well. That's powerful. Another real quick one, you know, we're, we're working on early, late 1800s, early 1900s right now. You know, another one is, you know, suffrage movement is something that every class, you know, the Library of Congress has loads of sheet music written, mm. anthems and all this stuff written. And it says it all about the suffrage movement in these lyrics from this old sheet music. And the covers are gorgeous, you know, mm. just the, 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 the you know, the, definitely that kind of art style of the time. And it's just like this, this one piece of sheet music with the lyrics and the cover kind of say all you need to say about the suffrage movement. And that's your primary source. So, yeah. you know, the goal is I, I want to um, reassure teachers that, you know, our lessons, if, if you draw inspiration from them and don't use anything from them, you know, we still consider that a success, right? If you think, oh, I can use music as a primary source, or I can, another great real quick uh, math lesson um, is um, students calculate like engagement rates on social media from Beyonce uh, Instagram posts, right? So they use all this calculus or not calculus. It's not that high level, but yeah. they use all this kind of algebra stuff to, to um, compare and contrast how different posts from different celebrities um, make engagement, right? Record sales, all that stuff. So, you know, if a teacher can come away with being like, oh, instead of like, 
you know, considering how much pounds of flour you need to make these cookies in a math class, let's talk about how many records Whitney Houston sold in the Bodyguard soundtrack, right? And compare that to how many she sold, you know, so that's the goal. That's the goal. That's that's incredible. I I I appreciate that. And and again, what a what a great way to build relevance and and meaning and and uh and there's just so many layers. Like even I'm just even thinking like um just album cover. I mean, just the interdisciplinary connections that you can draw, history, art. Uh, you know, I, I purposely have within arm's reach because we this this what's started out, you know, kind of our conversation. Uh, to begin with was Coltrane and uh, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, all of the, 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 the socio implications of, of an African-American musician taking on a Broadway show tune mm -hmm. using that, you know, and again, that, that show tune coming from uh, you know, the, the immigrant, the sons of immigrants. Right. I mean, there's just, <laughs> there's so many, there's just so many layers that you can take from just this song alone. Yeah. Putting in the context of 1962 when it was released, putting in the context of of the sound of music. Right. Um, uh, I mean, there's just again, yeah. you know, here we are developing a unit right now. We're not even, you know, again, just with yeah. the conversation of one piece of music. That's the beauty of, I think, what, what you all are doing with teacher. Yeah. Well, sometimes I think about this sometimes, like starting from Charlie Parker, like people don't think about enough that these quartets and quintets were like essentially cover bands you know what i mean yeah. like and that one is proof they take songs people want to hear and make them their own and it's like i don't you know with jazz scholarship and stuff i don't read a lot that acknowledges that fact and i i'm a little tickled by it i mean i mean my favorite things is a perfect example like he's covering a really popular song and he's doing it in a way that was mind-blowing right and mm -hmm. but he was still like you know you so you know I guess this is a shout out to the creativity of cover bands. Like John Coltrane was in a cover band, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Th think about Sinatra. I mean, right. he's not really, I think he's only, there's only one song that's attributed to him that he wrote. Everything else, I mean, he was a cover, he, you know, I, he covered the blues, show tunes, you know, the American songbook. I mean, yeah. Uh, it had great bands. The the Beatles, they, I mean, yeah. in essence, they, they were a cover band. That's how they started, you know? Now, um before anyone tracks me down i do want to say john coltrane was an amazing composer as well so yes. no, one, no one come after me on this yeah one. <laughs> i've got a love supreme right, the love you know, supreme, right the here love yeah right behind you. yes yes hey, hey ben they're gonna track me down before right. they track you down i'll be first and then they're where where, where is he where is he you know yeah so but you but i but divulge but uh yeah. but yes yes for all of you that are that are yelling at us right now <laughs> Uh, you know, Coltrane, we acknowledge his compositional um divinity. So yeah. <laughs> we we know, you know, giant steps changes. We know all of this. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So um yeah, thank you. Yeah, that that was a very yeah, often on often on the podcast, Ben, I have to do a few disclaimers <laughs> um, along the way. So I'm glad that you 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 jumped on that hand grenade. Yeah, um, you know, for me because uh, I, I I can think of a few people that 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 are good friends that are um, extreme aficionados of John Coltrane. So yeah, they. But hey, you know, my favorite things did did break a whole lot of uh, good ground uh, along along the way. What currently uh, I know you mentioned the Library of Congress um, partnership and congratulations on that with Teach Rock. What what what's in the works right now? Do you have do you have some things that uh, you and your team are uh, uh, kind of workshopping right now and and, um, and and working on right now? Yeah, that is um, by far the biggest, excuse me, sorry, let me start over. That was by far the biggest project we're working on because it is funded and there's a grant. So there are obviously deadlines and obligations. Absolutely. Um, Right now, and we do this at the very beginning of every year, we kind of look over a bunch of data, we see what we have, we see what we need, we see what teachers want. And one thing um, we don't have enough of is early elementary. That's right. And one of the reasons I think is where everyone on the team that I work with are all kind of 
music and history nerds that have many degrees between us. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're used to writing at a very high level. So I think a big project for us and we need, we're going to get help from teachers is really um, get some stuff available for kindergarten teachers and first grade teachers. We have a few, one of my favorites is we, um, a lesson that just um, talks about shapes by looking at electric guitars. Um, you know, a flying V versus a Les Paul, they're very different shapes. So that's one of our favorite lessons and it's very popular and students get to kind of identify shapes in a guitar and draw their own and design their own guitar. Um, but we need more like that. So um, I think our big goals this year are to continue this high school level music, uh, American history with music as a primary source project, but also start really figuring out what does it look like to implement music at the kindergarten level, first grade level, and the second grade level? Well, I know um, those that are listening, because I do I do have a, a few, and I am an elementary school principal, um, mm -hmm. and and I know, and, I, and I've have had the K-12 experience, but I know of several uh, folks that are in kinder world that are, that are listening, um, that are, I can, I, I can tell wheels are already spinning. Even as you say that, I'm thinking, you know, like the Beatles all together now, which, which has yeah. numbers and, and colors, um, Peter, Paul and Mary, their, their famous, um, children's album, Peter, Paul, and right. Mom, which, which would be a great narrative thing. So, uh, for those of you that are tuning in, uh, and I'll leave, um, a link to, uh, teach rock uh i'm sure ben, ben would would be happy to to curate some ideas and thoughts yeah i mean i can provide my email too yeah what we're trying to do this is insider info um we're hoping to get one or two elementary lessons out for i think april's national poetry month it is it is so um we're hoping to unveil at least one lesson we got to find some poetry and some music but we're hoping one or two will come out for that age range that kind of gets kids excited about music and poetry. Awesome. That's, and that'll, that, that is, that is definitely uh, well-timed. Um, speaking of albums, I have a few questions that, that I, I know I previewed with you. And uh, this is, this is, this is a gentle uh, safe space. So you, you did a very wonderful hat trick uh, with John, the John Coltrane disclaimer. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, there, there's, uh, just three questions that I, that I, uh, for season six that, that I'm, I'm curious in asking guests, uh, all, all along the lines of, of album and music and personal connections. So you ready? I'm ready. All right, my friend, what is your all time favorite album? Um, that's an impossible question, but I'll I give, know. I'll give one album and I'll tell you why it's, perhaps the most important in my life. So that album was uh, Super Unknown by Soundgarden. Wow. And I think that's one of the most important albums in my life because that album kind of, and I'm showing my age, but that kind of, that album represented my, my shift from listening to my parents' music to my own taste. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was in fourth or fifth grade during the, early hip hop grunge kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had albums before that. I remember me and my sister went halvesies on uh, an Arrested Development, if you remember that group. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was our first, it was a cassette tape. That was our first thing. And I was into it, but um, Super Unknown was the tape. It was a tape first. I got the tape uh, with my own money. And it was the first one I just listened to over and over and over and over. And like, I was playing drums at that point. So everything I wanted to be was Matt Cameron, the drummer. I started getting t-shirts, you know, I never saw them live, believe it or not, kind of a regret I have in my life. Um, but I think that album was the first one where I discovered I am a fan of music. I always loved music. I loved playing music, but like, that I listened to this album all the time in my little Sony Walkman um, and I could memorize every line and write. So that was, I don't know if that's my favorite album of all time, but that album certainly got me started in the path that I'm on. It's beautiful. Do you, do you still have a copy of the cassette? 
No, I have a after you know after I got one of those boom boxes. Uh-huh. I think I got it for Christmas with a cassette player and the CD player. I was yeah. like, first CD I'm gonna get is super unknown so i still have the cd i don't know what came of the cassette the cassette's gone but it's also an important album because it's the first cd it's not the first tape i bought with my own money but it was the first cd i bought with my own money because i love the tape so much oh yeah that's that's a beautiful memory i yeah yeah that what album or or even a piece of music has has served as a personal inspiration for you um I think the one that comes to mind first is an album called uh, Organic Music Society. I don't know if you've heard that one by Don Cherry. I know uh, Don Cherry, but Don I don't Ch- know that album. Yeah, Trump trumpeter. Yeah. Hmm? Don Cherry was a trumpeter, right? Yeah, yeah, trumpet player yeah. with Arnett Coleman. Right? Yeah. Um, the story with that album is he sooner or later moved to Sweden, and I think he he became like I mentioned he he became very interested in that that kind of spiritual jazz world that John Coltrane certainly a part of. Yeah. Um, Albert Eiler, I think, kind of falls into that, that kind of free jazz, spiritual kind of stuff, which is my favorite era of jazz. And um, this album, he just brought a bunch of people together um, to his house. He was married to a fabric, kind of a fabric artist. I don't know if that's how you describe it, an artist that works in fabric. Mm-hmm. And she, the house was covered. And this is like peak 60s, early 70s, you have to remember. So like the, the house was covered with these super psychedelic, gorgeous colored um, tapestries and stuff. And then he'd invite people over. He didn't care what musicians, any musician around, any musician touring Sweden, he'd invite over and they'd have these jam sessions. Nice. And at that point, he was way into Indian ragas and stuff. So this album, Organic Music Society, is... Um, just a recording of some of the jams that him and all of these musicians did. And, you know, at that point, global music was becoming a thing and African musicians that played Cora and stuff were traveling with, you know, jazz musicians. So all these diverse instruments. So like that album and knowing how spontaneous it is mm-hmm. and how creative it is, is kind of like, this this is a representative representation of like kind of the source of all things like that people can just come together and create things this beautiful on a whim together mm. just makes me incredibly happy and incredibly inspired yeah i love those kinds of intersections especially in music where um you know something that you wouldn't that something that is atypical of a genre or atypical of a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and it's, and it's very real and, and again, very organic, Um, you know, you know, of course, George Harrison playing the sitar Norwegian wood is is a perfect example of that. But then you, you, you see a lot of that in, in, in jazz and global music and just these kind of really neat things that, that, that pop up, um that you you wouldn't expect um you know when when springsteen you know started incorporating a viol a violin in the e street band and and, and mm-hmm. those things I'm like wow that it, it fits it works it's not supposed to or you know but but it works so i i, I love i love how how you frame that uh don cherry organic music uh society yeah. i'm gonna check i'm gonna check that organic out. music society it's very late 60s but i love it yeah. Um and- he worked with um why am I forgetting his name? The famous minimalist, uh, Terry Riley. Terry Riley showed up once in a while to his yeah. place and jammed with him. So it's just like this cool mixture of like everything that was going on at that era. I, I remember my introduction to Ornette Coleman was in the 80s with an album that he did with Pat Metheny, Song X. Mm. And and I was a big Pat Metheny fan. I still am. And and I remember that that was kind of like my first entry point into this kind of free jazz free music kind of world and and uh yeah that yeah, yeah. it just it, go, it goes on but yeah i'm i i greatly appreciate that uh that collaborative um uh, integration yeah. sensibility and i want to say that i mean i get that it, it it doesn't just have to be that to be inspiring like i could listen to someone like Leonard Cohen or Towns Van Zandt or someone 
whose work is much more composed, but I, I still get that feeling like, oh my God, how could someone, as one person like divine words and music this beautiful, you know? Yeah. Jason Molina, he's a newer one from Ohio. Um, um, he's another one that I listen to and I'm like, the, he, I don't know, I don't want to get too crazy, but I'm like, Leonard Cohen didn't write this song. He divined some other source that made this song happen. You know, I, I, I concur with you. I, was, I had a I had a similar conversation with um, a good friend of mine uh, who's been on the podcast uh, before, Max Pizarro. He's a he's a reporter and an editor and and writer. And and we were talking about like, you know, cats like Bach, Mozart. Beethoven, Dylan, let, uh, let's throw Leonard Cohen in the mix, you know, Joni Mitchell, you, you know, they're, they're on a whole diff, they're tuned into a different frequency that we don't get. And when you listen to something like Suzanne, Leonard Cohen, like mm -hmm. there's only, there's only so many notes, right. In, in, yeah. in, in music, there's only so many letters and, you know, the, and, and to take, yeah, the kind of limited, finite scope of notes, that limited, finite scope of letters and words, and to pull them all together in something. I mean, yeah, yeah it's it's something divine. It's something that on a different frame of the universe that 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 we don't get. Yeah, I. It reminds me of I saw a video recently. I think it was Leonard Bernstein talking about. Could be totally off, but I think it was Leonard Bernstein talking about Moonlight Sonata. Yeah. And he was saying the chords are totally normal. There's nothing unique about this chord progression. The melody is the most simple melody anyone, a kid could whistle that melody. And then he said, but what makes that piece perfect is somehow Beethoven attuned the exact correct note yeah. that would follow the previous note every single time. And I listen to songs like Suzanne or, you know, and I'm like, this song is perfect. And I don't know how, but it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. And I, I think it, I think Bernstein did, did, I think I've seen a similar mm -hmm. and, and, and he, and he, I mean, and again, probably I know the, the film uh, Maestro is, is out, but, but we would be remiss you and I as musicians and educators, not to take a nod to one of the great, music teachers of of our time you know um anytime that bernstein would would talk about music and 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 he yeah that that i i always press pause when when that comes up so i, I gotta get we got it we have to give that a nod but just mm -hmm. yeah how he framed i haven't it. seen that documentary yet i need to see it yeah it's yeah. it's um it's interesting and um some good stuff in there but i i just i'll youtube some of his stuff some of his um his speeches or lectures or young people's concert things. And it's, it's mm -hmm. just so, it's so fulfilling mm -hmm. um, about that. So, yeah, man, I, now, now I want to listen to some Leonard Cohen, Suzanne after this, man, <laughs> we, may, we may, we may have to, uh, I may have to do that. Uh, I will do that. There's so many good ones. Partisan yeah. who by fire, who by fire is one of my favorite. So powerful. Yeah. yeah on based on a prayer. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, man. Of course, hallelujah. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, which which is which is amazing. Um, what is a lesson from an album? You know, speaking of lessons in education, what is a lesson either from an album or a musician that that has helped to shape your profession, your your career? Or, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of have like a go to piece of music or album that instructs you right. as, as a professional. Um, yeah, well, I took this question to think about my work, not as a percussionist, because I could list a billion that, you know, inspired my my playing. But um, as my position at Teach Rock, as someone that is writing curriculum. And so the story is, I'm not, I'm going to belabor this a little bit before I get to the album. Please. Um, in college, I got to take the electives I wanted to take. I mentioned that. And I took um, African-American literature class. And it was probably the most mind blowing, like non musical class I took because it exposed me to so much literature that is frankly was buried and never 
you know, I, I read Invisible Man, I think, in high school, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, you learn about MLK, but you don't really, I hate to say it, but at least my experience in high school, you don't really read MLK. You don't read Letter from Birmingham, right? Hopefully it's changed. I really hope it's changed and people are reading Letter from Birmingham, Jail and stuff like that. Absolutely. But that was my first exposure to that kind of, that kind of perspective about American history. Autobiography of Malcolm X we read, you know, stuff that, you know, um, made me see American history different. And through that, um, I encountered a poet, um, modern poet named Saul Williams, um, slam kind of spoken word poet. And he was in, I think we watched a, his first film in the class. And first off, he's, again, we'll talk about like, I'm, I'm coming across a very spiritual kind of person, I think, but it, it's very kind of um, crazy spirituality in his work. But also a lot of he comes from that lineage of Amiri Baraka and, you know, that lineage of like very, very um, kind of truth telling and hidden histories and hidden people that aren't often discussed in American history. And so he released an album. His first album was Amethyst Rockstar. And it's a it's a crazy album because it's just him doing spoken word over music, kind of rock music. Um, I think Rick Rubin produced it. Nice. Um, and that was another album. Once I discovered his poetry, I just, I just listened to that album constantly. So, you know, and there's, you, you, you're well aware, Ginsburg made plenty of albums. There's a long history of, of spoken word poets, mm-hmm. um, you know, doing their thing to music. Um, so Amethyst Rockstar, Saul Williams, really, I think, informed how I want to think about at least history teaching and really want to focus on um, the hidden histories, the the people, um, you know, that, that aren't discussed in history. And it's something I always kind of try to keep in mind, especially doing this American history, you know, like, um, do we want to say, when we get to the rock era, do we want to say that Chuck Berry started it all? Or do we want to say that Sister Rosetta Tharp started it all, right? And and why might we want to say that Sister Rosetta Tharp? Why isn't she being acknowledged as much as she could have? You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. um, that work of his and that class in general really made me aware of kind of the the norm that often we understand history, but then the history that's understood by by other marginalized people often. And how do we bring those histories to bear? So I think that's the album that really inspired me in, in my current work with Teach Rock, especially when it comes to history curriculum, right? That's now that we're doing pre-K, I'd probably have to say Raffi or someone, you know. <laughs> now that we're we need to move to kindergarten curriculum. <laughs> yeah. Well, may there 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 may be there may be some elements there that that are beyond Raffi, right? You know, so um, I, I that that would that would be a fun project to delve into to see to see what you can mine uh, mm-hmm. and and connect. But I I am greatly um, appreciative of 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 you leaning in to this work in our profession and mm-hmm. and and attempting to do what is seemingly impossible but is so necessary mm. uh, not only for discourse but but necessary for our kids and 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 necessary for this generation and future generations um i i think you know it's not necessarily about getting kids to go uh to a record store and buy simon and garfunkel i think mm-hmm. but 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 it but if it, you know what you're doing with the vision and mission of, of teach rock, if, if it's going to influence kids to look at the world in a, in a deeper, more meaningful way, if it, if it's going to, if it's going to inspire kids to be more empathetic mm-hmm. and more connected, you, you all have done your job and I know you're doing your job uh, in, 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 in so many yeah. ways. That, I mean, thank you. I mean, that's the goal, not only to get kids um, intrigued in these um, subjects through music, but also kind of inspire them, right? Like, I think one of the beauties of music and all these artists we're talking about is they, they, 
vast majority of them didn't come from places of power. Their voices weren't, you know, you think of someone like Marvin Gaye, right? Mm -hmm. When he was born, he no, there was probably no expectation that his voice would be heard by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, sounds like ecology and so, but through music, this person who had, you know, a, a very strong voice, his voice could be heard, right? And you see that story over and over and over and over again. So if students see people like Marvin Gaye, I'm really hoping they say, yes, you know, I might not have been born under circumstances which I have a ginormous platform, but these people through music were able to make a difference, right? And and if we could inspire some students to to feel like, empower them that they could do the same thing, then, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy to be where I am doing what I do. Right on. And yep. and you're making, making the world a better place because, because of that. Ben Dumbald, thank you so much for thank you. being on. I've really enjoyed uh, our conversation and, and I look, I look forward to, to more conversations and, and more learning, learning here just in this conversation alone. Uh, I, I am I am ready to track down Organic Music Society. Oh, it's so good! I can pull you. I have the record. Of course, I have the vinyl for this one. Yeah, I'll show it to you after the after we. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want to see that. Yeah, and yeah. um, and 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 if and if folks want to connect and and follow, what what are what are the best ways to 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 do that? Well, if you want to just check out Teach Rock, it's just teachrock.org. Um. I'm happy to have people contact me and it's very easy. It's ben at teachrock.org. Nice. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So teachrock.org is, is the website. I highly recommend that folks uh, check that out there. There is just a wonderful archive of, of lessons. And as, as Ben said, you, you don't necessarily need to follow everything step by step. I mean, you can adapt and, and, um, modify as as you as you wish um anything to do to build that student engagement and, and create that that culture of, of that classroom culture of of inclusion and thought and discourse and creativity and then uh ben at uh, and again the email was it was ben at teach rock teach rock.org and feel free if you have i mean if you're have struggling any teachers out there kind of looking for something particular i would love to hear from you um I get less email. I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. I get less emails than you might expect. So um, feel free to email me, and I'll get back to you. Well, I uh, I will be dumping some ideas. I'm already again. I'm already thinking about this early childhood thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Also thinking of a way. Um, you know, I've been uh, the other album I've been listening to a lot lately is uh, Odyssey and Oracle by the Zombies. Um, and um, just a one. Know that one. Oh, pal, that's a great, great album. That's All like. Right. Um, their it's their masterpiece but it's it's just wonderful uh it's an album that just kind of defies category 60 i think it came out in 68 69 the big hit from it though um is time of the season mm -hmm. um, which closes the album but uh, there's just some wonderful uh literary nods that i used to um used to use so there's a song on there called a rose for for emily um which the title is taken from a you know the faulkner um short story and that that was my excuse to bring that song in and and try to draw some parallels and some shakespearean references as well but yes odyssey and and oracle um mm. that, that is that is your homework assignment dr ben all right easily <laughs> done gotcha this is the principal liner notes podcast this is sean gaylord signing off with our typical sign off don't forget to share with the world your dreams your ideas your vision and your music you help make the world a better place and the world needs your music and your ideas. Hope to catch you on the flip side. Hope to catch you at a record store and we'll, we'll, we'll listen to some Don Cherry together. Thanks again for tuning in. <laughs>